Sean Faircloth is the author of, his, of Attack of the Theocrats, How the Religious Right Harms Us All and What We Can Do About It. He comes to us today as Director of Strategy and Policy for the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science. And um, I believe Dawkins has said of him that he is, has a proven ability to strategize, organize, and energize. And I think you'll agree with that once you get a chance to hear him. Uh, and I'd add to that that Sean has single-handedly raised the sights of our movement. He's improved our ability to challenge the religious right and to raise the profile of secularism in this country. And I know Sean personally and consider him a good friend. And I'll add that I've learned him to be a whiz at trivia, uh, something you may not know. And um, because of Sean, I get to boast of having one trivia night at two separate locations in Washington, D.C. so far. And, um, and now you may know that if you've done trivia nights that you want to pick something kind of interesting for a name, you know, something a little twisted or clever. And I believe our last one with the winning was uh, Romney's Supercuts. So uh, I'd like to, you have to think about that a little bit. And I'd like you to um, uh, give a warm welcome to Sean, uh, religious liberty guru, secular activist, and trivia king. <laughs> That was my favorite introduction ever. <laughs> Trivia King. I like that. Actually, I do, I kind of feel like uh, Roy and Maggie, they are uh, very good friends, and I kind of consider uh, uh, folks, a lot of folks here, to be kind of like family. And, and I just wanted to uh, mention that my mom died uh, a week ago, uh, a week ago today. And I think of it, uh, I'm looking toward the positive. We're going to have a big celebration for her at the end of the month. My mom was, we think, the longest serving child protective investigator in the state of California and maybe in the entire United States. And, uh, and she was also my absolute best speech editor. I always went to her for a couple decades uh, to look over my speeches and help me with those. And so today, actually, um, there's a speech that I used to give regularly, and I'm uh, going to deliver it today. Uh, we're going to tape it, and it'll be the last time, and it'll be a speech that's kind of in, in honor of, of my mother. And my mother was someone who liked to debate and discuss, usually more debate, uh, I mean, from when I was a little kid until uh, just last week. Uh, and she didn't necessarily always agree with me. I remember in particular when we were talking about the Middle East and uh, uh, Muslim extremists and so forth. I remember we were discussing uh, Abu Ghraib and a Mr. Al Jamadi that some of you uh, may know. And maybe the name Al Jamadi doesn't uh, ring a bell, but he was one of those uh, who was imprisoned at Abu Ghraib and allegedly was involved in the uh, bombing uh, that killed. Uh, 12 people at the Red Cross in Baghdad. Uh, you may remember that incident. Now, many Americans, to your credit, I bet you there's people in this room who adamantly protested against the kind of torture that occurred at Abu Ghraib. And some of that torture led to uh, the death, at least in one case, of Mr. Al Jamadi. But I want people in this room to consider uh, another type of area for potential protest. Uh, there was a child with a treatable tumor that grew uh, on a four-year-old, and it grew from this child's eye until the tumor was the size of the child's head. And the four-year-old, uh, in great pain, uh, was walking in the hallway of her little home, and the tumor smeared blood down the wall of her home. Now this child, one thing we know for sure about this child is that she was 100% innocent of any uh, wrongdoing. She just happened to be born in a faith healing home. Another example, there was a two-year-old who suffered an entirely treatable bowel obstruction, uh, but the child uh, happened to live in a faith healing home, and after screaming in agony for several horrific days, uh, vomiting fecal matter, the child this utterly innocent child died. Now I want you to consider the most important of these stories. There was a nine-year-old boy. Now child protective workers uh, in his state were alerted 
uh, to a concern of medical neglect with regard to this child. And they went and saw the boy. The boy's foot was uh, clearly hurting. And now, in a typical home, what would happen is the child protective workers would take the child to a doctor and they, the child would receive medical attention. But in this faith healing home, as in over 30 states with laws like this, the child protective workers were constrained by a separate legal standard for so-called faith healing homes. And the government, instead of holding the innocent child blameless, they actually provide a separate protection for the so-called faith healing parents. And so unlike in typical cases, the child protective workers had to determine, well, it, they had to wait for a more extreme situation. Was the child in a case where they might uh, be in immediate danger of dying? And they looked at the child. It was, he was pale, his foot hurt, but he was talking, he was coherent. So they said, well, trying to obey the law, they'll come back in a few days. They came back in a few days and the boy had died from a perfectly treatable, indeed a type of leukemia with an 80% chance of recovery had it been appropriately treated. So I commend those, probably people in this room, who protested about what happened at Abu Ghraib. But where are the protests in our society for these children that number in the hundreds? One study of a faith healing congregation, the Faith Assembly Congregation, the study showed that the infant mortality rate was 270% higher than that of the general population. Now, the ministers in these faith healing congregations can honestly say to their congregation that there is a separate legal standard for them and their so-called horribly misnamed faith healing. Now, some, some will say, well, that's, that's the constitutional right under the First Amendment. They can say that, but it is false. Under the United States Supreme Court decision of Prince versus Massachusetts, there is no First Amendment free expression clause right to place a child in a situation of ill health or death. No, these are merely statutes, politicians succumbing to political pressure from religious organizations. And this area, this one area of harm to children, hundreds of children, is just one of many. I, there's another uh, speech I give, it's on YouTube, Can Religion Justify Bullying Children, in which I give many examples, not just of social attitudes, but laws in America where children are harmed based on religious bias in American law. And that one area of children's harm is just one of 10 that I write, 10 areas of law, 10 topics that I write about in my book of injustice based on religious bias, not in social attitude, but in American law that harms real people every day in this country. And we talk about, at the Richard Dawkins Foundation, a 10-point vision of a secular America to address these injustices that exist in current American law that harm real people. And it makes us want to, I hope, ask the question, what kind of society are we? And where are we headed as a society that these kinds of injustices exist? And unfortunately, John Witt, who is at the Center for the Study of Separation of Church and State at Emory University, said that as a practical matter, the separation of church and state is no longer the law of the land in the United States of America today. And we have to ask, how did we get here? Well, for me, part of the story of what happened uh, reminds me of an experience I had in high school. I was a very shy kid and I wanted to overcome my shyness so I tried out for the high school play and I studied hard and I got lucky and I got the lead in Inherit the Wind, uh, the, the Clarence Darrow part about the Scopes monkey trials. And if, uh, here I am in, in the play there, that's the girl who, she was playing the minister's daughter, I remember her, no luck there. but. <laughs> But what I tell you, if you really want to affect a young person's attitude about uh, evolution and about science, have them memorize all of Clarence Darrow's lines uh, from the Scopes Monkey Trials. And I think they, they uh, put me in that role because of my great resemblance uh, to Clarence Darrow. <laughs> you can see that there. But what's important about that play is that it was written in the 1950s looking back on the 1920s, and you could tell by the whole tone, the whole tenor of the play, that they were saying, oh, remember those bad old days? Those creationist bad old days, religious fundamentalist bad old days? We're moving on to the uplands of enlightenment, of rational values in government. That's where they thought we were headed. But unfortunately, it did not turn out that way in American society. 
And don't get me wrong, churches were powerful in mid-20th century America, but something in the nature of church power has changed because it's not the little church with the humble cottage for the minister next door anymore. What we're talking about is the mega church and the rise of the mega church in American society with the fitness treatment center, you know, with the ice cream parlor, with the broadcasting facility, and with the multi-million dollar lobbying effort. It is a huge and unregulated business universe that did not exist in the same way 30 to 40 years ago. You know, Rush Limbaugh, he'll raise his fist against that special rights for gay people. Well, I've never understood because to me, treating people equally is not special rights. But if you place one class of people over another class of people on the basis of religion, that is special rights. It's immoral and it's wrong and we need to do something about it. And think about who we're giving the special rights to in American society. These aren't exactly vulnerable people. I mean, to people like Franklin Graham and his father, Billy Graham, they're the ones who are getting special rights in America today. Billy Graham, who talked about the synagogues of Satan. Billy Graham, who said his Vietnam policy was to send fire upon the earth. The Billy Graham who talked to his very close friend, Richard Nixon, about how he's concerned about what the Jews are doing to this country. That Billy Graham and their multi-million dollar organization, they have special rights in America today? Yes. Yes, they do. And Rick Warren, Rick Warren of inaugural fame. Rick Warren, who as a minister is worth something approaching $10 million. That Rick Warren, the Rick Warren who compared Terry Schiavo's husband to a Nazi. The Rick Warren who says that Jews, among others, will all burn in hell because they aren't following his particular doctrine. His multi-million dollar organization gets special rights in America today? Yes, yes they do. And of course, my favorite, Ted Haggard, who preaches against gay sex while having gay sex on meth. Does he get special rights in America today? Yes. Yes, he does. And so does the multi-million dollar organizations that they pour money into. That's what we're facing in our society today. But when I say huge power, it's so pervasive that I think sometimes we don't notice how significant the power is. I mean, just in their employment context, even in states that have strong anti-discrimination laws, they can say, oh, a janitor, you're a Jew, you're fired. The gardener, you're an agnostic, you're fired. You know, the, the clerk who handles the finances, you're an atheist, you're fired. That's tremendous power in American society that they have. You know, back in 1970, there were fewer than 100 megachurches in the United States. Now there are hundreds upon hundreds of these businesses, and that's what they are, having a huge influence on American society. Mark my words, beware of the religio-industrial complex, because that is what we are facing. And you can understand how if you're a well-intentioned politician, you would be hesitant to speak out in this society. And I want us to do a, a little mind experiment uh, to illustrate what this might mean. We're going to all pretend we're political consultants uh, in this room, and we're going to help someone who's going to run for Congress. A Charlotte is going to run for Congress. Let's give her a round of applause for her candidacy. She'd be a great candidate. And I know from my experience, I was majority whip in my last term, help recruit candidates, that we're going to do Charlotte a favor, uh, and that is we're going to Google the heck out of her, look at all those Facebook posts from last night in the French Quarter, you know, and see if you got any little John Edwardsy kind of stuff going on that you need to tell us about in advance before the other side finds out. But we did, Charlotte, dig out a few quotes from you that we have to discuss here in private in our consulting firm. Quote number one, you said, that the clergy dreads the advance of science as witches do, the approach of daylight. So no diplomacy courses when you were in school or anything like that. No. Quote number two, that you look forward to when the human mind gets back to the freedom that it had 2,000 years ago. Wouldn't your grandma think that's sort of a slap in the face to Christianity? I can't imagine you'd say something like that, Charlotte. And then, and then quote number three, that you also look forward to when the mystical generation of Jesus is treated the same as the generation of Minerva <laughs> from the brain of Jupiter. This is not going to sound too well in a press conference, Charlotte. I'm sorry. Um, so we know what we might say. We might be really pleased with a candidate like that. But 
in the practical world of American politics in 2012, what are we going to say to a candidate who has those kind of statements on their record? Well, I know what I would say. I'd say, geez, thank you, Charlotte, so much for coming. We really appreciate you being here with us today. Please leave your $10,000 check with the receptionist, and maybe you could have a career in accounting. Uh, candidate Thomas Jefferson, because every quote was from Thomas Jefferson. And how, how do we get here in American society? Well, one clue was the 1984 Republican Convention, where the minister, hand-selected by Ronald Reagan, said, and I quote, there's no such thing as the separation of church and state. It is merely a figment in the imagination of infidels. Infidels like Thomas Jefferson, who coined the phrase, the wall of separation of church and state. We could lose Thomas Jefferson, one of the greatest presidents in American history. We could lose someone like that today. Thomas Jefferson, the author of the Declaration of Independence, might be lost to us because he dared to think independently. Now consider this radical quote. In no instance have the churches been the guardians of the liberties of the people. James Madison, the father of the Constitution, Thomas Jefferson said separation of church and state. James Madison said total separation of church and state. You know, Thomas Jefferson, he was tall, he was handsome, he played the violin, the women kind of dug him. Whereas James Madison, sort of short, stumpy, a little socially awkward, he's my guy. He was, he was awesome. And, you know, while some were pleased that President Obama makes a little less of a big deal uh, of the National Day of Prayer than did his predecessor in office, James Madison opposed the existence of government-sponsored prayer. The Richard Dawkins Foundation, the Secular Coalition, AHA, many of the organizations in this room speak out against uh, faith-based initiatives which get our tax money to discriminate and proselytize with our tax dollars. We speak out on those issues. Think about James Madison. James Madison, when a proposal came before James Madison that didn't give a dime to a church, but was going to offer to the church to, uh, for the church to uh, uh, engage in a governmental function, James Madison said, even though no tax money was going to the church, that even that was too much of an intermingling of church and state. So in terms of improving the basic conception of what government is, and what it means, the best ideas, the separation of church and state, the protection of minority rights. It was really Jefferson and Madison who were the Lenin and McCartney of political thought. They were the ones who brought the fantastic new ideas forward. And some will say, well, oh, Thomas Jefferson, he was a Christian, or fine. He was the type of Christian, Thomas Jefferson, who specifically rejected the resurrection, specifically rejected the divinity of Christ, rejected the immaculate conception. In fact, he rejected all miracles. Not exactly the type of Christian that would be accepted in the Republican Party today and perhaps not even in the Democratic Party today. So, however, he was someone who won elections, despite the fact that religious organizations almost unanimously opposed him in the 1800 election. Why? Well, as some surveys show, about only 10 to 15 percent of Americans in 1800 were regular church attenders. So that might be partly why he was able to win an election. But I was on talk radio a couple years ago and someone said, well, Jefferson, Madison, they're just two guys. So, <laughs> so let's, let's go to Adams. Adams, who was perhaps the most Christian of our early presidents, and here's what he said. The United States is the example of government erected on the simple principles of nature. Government, quote, founded on the natural authority of the people alone, without a pretense of miracle or mystery. And Adams added that this was a great point gained in favor of the rights of mankind. And it was Adams who signed the treaty, unanimously approved by the Senate, approved by his Secretary of State that said the United States government is, quote, not in any sense founded on the Christian religion, not in any sense. And that language was approved by his predecessor in office, George Washington. That would be the same George Washington who rarely attended church, 
rarely took communion when he did attend church, and unequivocally refused the last rites of the church as he lay conscious and dying. So Washington, Adams, Jefferson, Madison, these were leaders and they were thinkers thinkers of the 1700s Enlightenment, which sometimes made them lightning rods, if you will, which is an apt analogy. If you remember Ben Franklin, uh, you know, true story, when Ben Franklin invented the lightning rod, uh, he was condemned by ministers on both sides of the Atlantic because that meant that the lightning would not hit the sinner. You know, that would be wrong, newfangled lightning rod. But as the 1800s progressed, we saw the rise of what nowadays we would call fundamentalism. And nonetheless, some of the young politicians didn't get the memo to sort of change the way they spoke. One young politician, in fact, said, quote, the Bible is not my book, nor Christianity my profession. That would be Abraham Lincoln, who never joined a church and, according to his best friend and law partner, died an unbeliever. Now, I don't know whether Lincoln was a believer or not, but what I do know is that if Abraham Lincoln were confronted with his own words today, he'd have trouble getting elected to Congress, much less to the presidency of the United States of America. Now let's turn to the Lincoln of American letters, Mark Twain. His greatest book, Huckleberry Finn, the great conflict in that novel is that Huck is going to help his friend Jim escape slavery. And Huck, in a great act of bravery, knows that if he does this, he will burn in hell forever, according to clear church teachings. But Mark Twain was also uh, quite clear. He said, quote, if there is a God, he is a malign thug. Mark Twain also said, I cannot see how a man of any large degree of humorous perception can ever be religious. Now, I'm not saying that everybody has to agree with Mark Twain, but Mark Twain needs to be included. He needs to be included as part of the great American tapestry, and one person who agreed that he should be included was Jack Kennedy. It was Jack Kennedy who said that America is where every man has the right to attend or not attend the church of his choice, and that no church or church school is granted any public funds or political preference. Contrast Jack Kennedy's policies with policies we've seen in recent decades. And the one example is the Golden Christian School, one of these schools that got government funds where the curriculum seemed to consist entirely of watching videotapes. Now, in my opinion, not just in uh, religious schools get tax money, I don't think they should get any tax money, but I think that in our taxpayer-funded public schools, we should teach the Bible, for sure. We should teach the Koran, and then we should teach the Constitution of the United States of America. And which of these documents evolves? Which changes over time? And which are cast in stone, Stone Age attitudes of barbaric viciousness and violence and vindictiveness? America needs to be made safe for the ideas of people like Twain and Darrow, and politics needs to be made safe for the ideas of Jefferson and Madison. Let us follow two golden rules. First, do not to your neighbor what you would take ill from him. Now, you may be thinking of Jesus Christ when you hear this quote, and good for him, but that quote comes from the Greek philosopher Pittacus, five centuries before Christ. And a second golden rule. The United States Constitution, Article 6, Section 3, that federal officials shall be bound to support the Constitution, but no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under these United States. You see, the beauty, the beauty of the Constitution is that it is designed specifically on a theory of evolution. The Bible, the Koran, they reject evolution but not just in a scientific sense, they reject evolution in a humanistic sense. Blacks, women, gay people, sorry, your application was received 2,000 years too late. Too bad for you. Madison's genius was his humbleness, his humbleness in knowing that what he knew in 1787 wasn't all there was to know. You know, for me, the real books of Revelation are Darwin, and Einstein, who offered profound, new, and elegant ways of looking at our universe. And just as dramatically and just as importantly, Madison offered new and marvelous ways of looking at how our society interacts. You know, Einstein showed us that light bends, and Madison showed us 
that the light of justice bends, and I am glad to report that it is bending in the right direction. Among people who are age 65 and older, we commend those, the 7% approximately of those who have a scientific or naturalistic worldview. We thank them for taking the lead. But among people who are age 30 and under, the percentage is almost four times that much. The trends are in our direction. So the religious right, they've been organized for decades, and we in the secular movement, at the Richard Dawkins Foundation, with the American Humanist Association, with the Secular Coalition, we are really only coming together in these very recent years with political involvement. But justice and the trends are on our side, but we need your active leadership and involvement. You know, President Jimmy Carter said he's visited 125 nations uh, since he left the White House, and he has observed that people treat John Lennon's song, Imagine, as equal to the national anthems of their respective countries all over the world. And Lennon, who was a poet, and Madison, who was a lawyer, coming from very different backgrounds, became increasingly focused in their lives on how human beings could interact better with each other, to, as the Greek said, tame the savageness of man and make gentle the life of this world. Madison imagined a constitution that was an ever-flexible mechanism seeking greater justice, and imagine now a world anthem constitutes a vision of where that justice can lead us. But our efforts are not yet worthy of their vision. In the scripture, God instructs Abraham to kill his own child. We should remember that story as part of our culture. But let us also remember those children I described at the beginning. Remember that seven-year-old boy whose life could have been saved had the law been equal for all. We cannot sit silently while a modern Abraham is authorized to let their own child die in the name of God. Not in this country, not with our laws, not in this century, and not with our Constitution. The vicious Joe McCarthy era foisted upon us the phrase, one nation under God, when we've always really been one nation under the Constitution. I am devoting my life to this cause, and I call upon every one of you listening today to devote a part of your life to this effort. We have a patriotic obligation to make a great country even greater. You know, my mother in her job was very gratified to save the lives of hundreds of children. With the examples that I've given here, we in the secular movement can save hundreds and even thousands of children, but that is only the beginning. We can work to change society in a dramatic way because the way I see it, we have, if we take the 100,000 years of human history, there's only been the last 400 years or so where we've really had the enlightenment that's been gaining momentum and force. For that small little sliver of time, we've made tremendous progress, and I feel we are on the cusp, and that together we can change American society for the better. I ask us to take specific action, to organize politically focused secular coalitions in every single state of the union. I will work with every one of you, but we must all work together as a team. All the organizations, all the individuals, and we, can make a great nation even greater. Thank you very much.